Welcome back investors, Jake here. It's been a volatile two weeks in the stock market, so let's go ahead and check in with the other finance YouTubers. Obviously, I get all my financial advice from YouTube, and we got Graham Stephan here 16 hours ago. The market is about to drop again. Andre Jeek 16 hours ago, market crash begins, how to prepare. Jeremy from Financial Education, the market crash is not over. Look at this. Well, geez, guys, all the experts are saying uh, things are looking bad out there. All right, let's log on to my brokerage accounts and sell everything. And what is this? The Dow Jones up 1.56%, S&P up 2.1%, NASDAQ up 3%, Russell 2000 up 2.8%, and the VIX volatility has gone down by 18%. Well, that seems odd. I thought I thought all the experts were telling me to sell. And obviously, guys, I'm just joking around. Nobody can predict the future. However, the market just does this. About once a month, there's a there's a pullback and a panic, and finance YouTubers are just gonna clickbait you with these doomsday thumb thumbnails and titles about the market going down. And I will say that the pullback that we had in late September, October was a bit more dramatic. Likewise, with this pullback here in December, also pretty dramatic. And the bottom line, guys, is I'm not selling until the money runs out. And people have money. They want to spend it. They want to invest it. When everybody here is selling, selling, where's their money going? Are they going to put it in real estate? Are they going to put it in crypto or commodities? Everything is at all-time highs. And the money's not going to run out until the money actually runs out. When tapering ends... When federal, uh, when the interest rates go up, and even then, guys, it's not going to be a crazy stock market crash where the market goes down by 20, 30, or 40 percent. More likely, what I think is going to happen is the market's just going to trade sideways for a while. It might be flat for years potentially, but as long as uh, unemployment remains good, the economy is strong, uh, our, our nation's largest companies continue to grow. The stock market is fine. If you're holding index funds, you have nothing to worry about. So in this video, let's go over my Schwab portfolio, and I just want to kind of recap for you all the positions that I'm currently in and why I didn't sell anything. In fact, as the market pulled back, I just bought more. I leveraged more money. Now, a video that you might want to check out is this Stochastics Explained. And I'm watching this now. Whenever I make a, a, a position, either selling or entering, this technical indicator is pretty reliable, and I just like watching it. And the stochastics line is down here. You can add it on Yahoo Finance or any other uh, technical software that you use. But the percent %K line is the black line, and as soon as it got below the percent %D line, that was an indication that there might be a sell-off. And look at that. It pulled down, it pulled down, it kept falling, it kept falling. It was in the overbought range, and then it got into the oversold range. And as soon as the percent %K got back above the percent %D, that was an indication, according to the technicals, that the market was going to start buying back in. And sure enough, here we are two days later. The percent %K is way above the percent %D. It's, it's shooting back up through the sweet spot and it's heading back towards this overbought rate uh, range. Now, if all that technical jargon, jargon made no sense to you, you can check out that video if you want to learn more. But I've been watching this the last two weeks being like, yeah, the market probably will keep going lower. So I added some more positions here, I added some more positions here, and now it's bouncing back nicely, as it kind of just does. You can kind of just look at these lines as the percent %K uh, pulls below the D, it eventually turns and then the market just continues its upward trend. So if you get nervous when you see a red day or a sell-off, you can check the stochastics and it, it gives me a little bit of comfort of when is the sell-off going to end? When is it going to turn around and start trending back up? And in my accounts, I'm up huge today and obviously that can change tomorrow. It can change day to day. In my Robinhood accounts, I haven't been showing you guys this, but I've been trading debit spreads, which is the most volatile, high-risk form of options trading, basically. And my account is up 25% today, or about $5,800. 
And the stocks that I'm trading debit spreads on, there's no hidden gems here. It's the, it's the stocks that are in my Schwab account. Texas Instruments, Berkshire, Capital One, HCA, Microsoft, um, Striker, which I don't actually have in my Schwab account. And my Schwab account today is up $5,300 or about 9%. Uh, year to date, started this year with $25,000, haven't made any deposits through options trading, I'm up 138%. So it's a good day, good day for the Schwab portfolio. Now, when you see this, I don't want to give you false expectations of what's realistic. Over 75% of my net worth is in S&P 500 index funds. Between my IRA, my 401k, and my Fidelity accounts, that is, you know, the overwhelming majority of my assets. So in my Robinhood accounts, I'm just having fun, guys. I mean, this could easily go to zero because I'm being so risky with it. But in my Schwab accounts, I'm trying to be much more measured. I'm trying to reduce risk. I'm trying to find a way to get dramatic returns, leveraging my money with call contracts with very low downside risk. And I can do this by several ways. The first one is that all of the calls that I've purchased in my Schwab accounts have very far out expiration dates, usually January of 2023 or six months out like Capital One, June of 2022. So if there is a crazy volatile pullback in the market this month like there was, I don't have a reason to panic sell. I have plenty of time for these call contracts to recover. Additionally, I'm just leveraging my money on very boring, predictable, safe, large cap S&P 500 stocks. The finance YouTube community isn't going to get fired up. These videos are not going to get hundreds of thousands of views when I talk about uh, HCA Healthcare or General Dynamics or Texas Instruments or Berkshire Hathaway. You know, the finance YouTube community wants to pump these IPO SPACs and, and crazy Penny stocks like Corsair Gaming or Tattooed Chef or Palantir. That's what gets the buzz. But I want to find companies that have good valuations and almost no downside risk. Obviously, you can't get that guarantee. There can always be a newsworthy event or a bad quarter or a change in, in leadership that, that in the short term hurts the prospects of these companies. But I'm being very deliberate in the stocks that I pick where I say, what is the worst case scenario? How does how does it how does it go down dramatically? And I'm doing everything I can once again to reduce risk to get dramatic returns. For example, these calls that I bought on Apple 2 months ago, I'm up 84%. I don't need to YOLO on SPACs or IPOs to you know to get more dramatic returns buying the stock when I can just buy reliable companies and then leverage my money to get these kinds of dramatic returns. 84% in two months on a boring, on the most obvious company you know, in the S&P to put your money into. I'll take that any day. So let's go through the technicals of all the positions that I'm in, and then we'll talk uh, briefly about the fundamentals. Just once again, if you haven't been following my Schwab accounts or all the positions that I've been taking. The first one is HCI, and this is not like the others. I actually did purchase the stock here. I don't uh, buy options on uh, companies not in the S&P 500, basically. And HCI year-to-date is up 123%. And the only reason why I'm in this is because one of their subsidiaries, TipTap, is being spun off in an IPO soon. We're waiting for the details of the IPO, so we don't know what the valuation is going to be in. We don't know where, where, when it's going to IPO. We don't know what its expected market cap at listing is going to be. But because this is an insurance company that's expanding nationwide, I mean, how can its IPO valuation not be bigger than $1 billion? My estimate is it should be based on Lemonade and other comparable IPOs that recently happened. TipTap's IPO valuation market cap should be closer to two to three billion. So if TipTap alone is going to be worth two to three billion, and TipTap is already included in the valuation of HCI, and HCI's valuation right now is only 1.1, there's a horrible mismatch in pricing here. So we just need to get the details of this IPO. This stock could explode tremendously, you know, shoot up to 200 or $300. That wouldn't surprise me. But there is 
downside risk, which is why this is only 20% of my portfolio. I'm only or 17% now. The reason why is, you know, with all these growth stocks collapsing in the small caps, uh, it, it, the IPO might not happen or it might not get a good valuation. That's why HCI has been selling off in the short term. So just something to be cautionary about this stock. And with any individual stock position you take, you must always remember there's an opportunity cost for not just buying an S&P 500 index fund. The S&P 500 year to date now is up 27%. That's a pretty good year for the market, guys. So if you're holding Airbnb or DoorDash or Palantir and you're down 20, 30, 40%, or if you're in Peloton and down 70%, not only did you lose money on picking one of these stocks, but you didn't make money. There's an opportunity cost. You could have just bought S&P 500 index funds. So that's why a majority of my holdings are in index funds, but I am going to try and use long calls to leverage my money to try and beat the market average. So let's go through each of my individual stock positions. First one being Apple, year to date it's up 32%. And watch out guys, it just hit an all-time high. Now, objectively, based on the fundamentals, you could argue that Apple is uh, overvalued, but you can say the same thing about NVIDIA or Tesla or these other companies that just have a premium valuation because uh, people are so dedicated to them. People love their products and services so much. So when Apple got to about 150 a share uh, about six months ago, and then traded sideways for six months, I said, this stock is due for a breakout. There's going to be a newsworthy event or a really good quarter, and it's going to shoot off. And as soon as it can get above a level of resistance and hit all-time new highs, it's going to get to a nice-sounding nice number, basically. So it's at all-time highs at 171. I would not be shocked if it gapped up again tomorrow and the day after that. The reason why is nobody is selling. There's no sellers up here. We've broken through the most recent line of resistance. So where's Apple's share price going to go? It's probably going to go to 190 or 180, a nice sounding round number, and then it's going to start channeling sideways again. It's going to spend six months or a year and start channeling uh, in a range. And if it does that, I'll just sell out for a profit. I'm, I'm already up 86% on this. Next stock is Berkshire Hathaway, and uh, Warren Buffett is only up 24% this year, so he's slightly underperforming the market. But once again, uh, look at this stock. It shot up huge early in the year. It hit about 300 or 290 a share, and it's been trading sideways for over six months. So I've been looking in the S&P for companies that have these kinds of technicals where it's channeling in a, in a range between 270 and 290, just bouncing up and down uh, the 20-day, 50-day, and 100-day moving averages are all basically lined up. And it's waiting for this 200-day moving average to catch up. And as soon as it touches it, uh, the stock often will then jump and go to the next nice round number. So I bought some call contracts on this. Hopefully in the next week or so, uh, Berkshire can break through this 290. But even if it doesn't, I'm not worried. I don't see much downside risk here. Next position is Capital One, and same pattern. All the moving averages uh, are basically lined up. The 200-day had to catch up to it. Now, the entire finance sector, all, all the bank stocks sold off because um, investors were pricing in that interest rates might not be raised next summer. Banks make more money when interest rates go up. However, Capital One does a lot of auto finance loans and uh, credit card uh, credit cards. So the fact that it's being sold off with the banks, it is a bank, but it's it's more than that. Uh, it does much more consumer service industry. So there was a sell off. It actually got down to 138, uh, and it's trending back up. Hopefully, it can get back above that. 200-day moving average, and then get through this line of resistance at about 175. I think they're going to have an amazing quarter in January, and I'm hoping the stock can get to 200 before it just starts trading sideways again. Next stock is General Dynamics, and similar to the other stocks, it shot up huge to about 190, 200, and then over the last six months, it's been consolidating sideways between 
190 and 210, just bouncing up and down, waiting for that 200-day moving average to touch. This is the technical event, and as soon as it touches, it starts going up again. And uh, General Dynamics is a very well-managed, well-run company doing stock buybacks, so I'm sure that they were buying back their own stock on this dip. When you look at these stochastics, I didn't show you for the other ones, but once again, they were in the oversold range, percent %K over percent %D, uh, it's, it's trending back up nicely. Next company is HCA, up 47% for the year. That's pretty good. Once again, trended up nicely, shot up huge on earnings, and then started consolidating sideways between this 240 and 250, 260 range. The moving averages have all caught up, but except for the 200, the 200-day 200 almost touched it last week in the sell-off. I don't think this will take off just yet. I think we might need a couple more weeks, but you never know. It could, it could take off uh, sooner than I thought. Once again, percent %K over percent %D, uh, the technicals are showing that it's going to start uptrending again. Last stock to mention is Texas Instruments, uh, only up 22% for the year. All of the semiconductors uh, basically got ahead of themselves and went up huge in 2020. So this stock hit a nice round number, 195, almost 200, uh, over six months ago. And it's just been trading sideways in this range between 185 and 200, waiting once again for that 200-day moving average to caught up. And it's not even in the sell-off, guys. Like looking at this chart, would you have noticed there was a huge sell-off this month in Texas Instruments? And uh, it stayed above that 250, using it as a line of support. Gapped up huge today. We're hoping that it can get uh, through this $200 line of resistance. Okay, that was a lot of technicals that I just threw at you in a short amount of time. I basically condensed eight or nine videos into this one summary video. People like these kind of portfolio recaps of all the positions. If you guys like this video, give me a thumbs up to help with the algorithm. Subscribe if you haven't already. And let's just go now through the one page summary, the one screen summary of the fundamentals of these six positions. We're not talking about HCI because their fundamentals don't make any sense. The price to earnings of HCI is, is like 140. So obviously you're pricing in the future growth of TipTap. Once this insurance company uh, expands beyond the six states they're in now to go national. So let's focus on these six and why do I buy long calls on these six companies? And there's lots of things you can look at like gross margin or uh, debt levels. Obviously, there's some red flags with some companies that give them higher risk and lower valuations. But basically, you can just look at revenue growth, income, net income growth. Does it offer a dividend? Uh, are, is the share count uh, being reduced? And then what is its price to earnings, price to sales, and maybe price to book value or price to free cash flow? So revenue growth on the income statement is the top line. That's where that expression comes from. What is your top line? And net income on the income statement is the bottom line. What is the bottom line of this company? So let's just quickly go through all of these numbers. With Apple, their revenue growth year over year, so from third quarter last year to third quarter this year, up 28%. That is, that is phenomenal for a company of its size. Obviously, this is a global actor. It's, you know, Apple's more powerful than most governments in the world. And, you know, they're selling MacBook Pros and iPhones in like 180 languages or something. General Dynamics, much slower growth. This is a company that, uh, you know, survives off government contracts. It's a defense contractor. However, their income is pretty predictable and pretty stable. I don't see world peace being achieved anytime soon, and the defense budget only goes up over time. So even though this is a very small number, General Dynamics, uh, I, I still think in the long term is a safe place to put your money. Texas Instruments up 21%, pretty pretty good for a uh, semiconductor stock. Capital One only up 2.1%. And you got to remember that interest rates last year uh, were dropped to basically zero, and financial stocks can't make as much money when interest rates go down. We'll talk more about this revenue growth in a second. Berkshire Hathaway, a, you know Warren Buffett being boring, only up 11%. And then HCA Healthcare up 14%. Everyone knows you need revenue growth. This is, this is obvious. 
So with income, net income, I want it to be positive. I don't care how much, but it needs to be positive every quarter. Can this company turn a profit? And Apple up 62%. This is uh, insane. General Dynamics only up a little bit, uh, but this is a deceptive number. With all of these numbers, uh, they all had positive net income, but they didn't all have positive net income growth year over year. Because with net income, with depreciation and um, writing off uh, certain assets, you can fudge the numbers. So, for example, Berkshire was down 65%. They weren't negative. They were just down year over year from third quarter last year to third quarter this year. So they were still positive by billions of dollars. It just wasn't as much as third quarter last year. The number I wanted to show you, though, is Capital One. Because look at this. <clears throat> Even though... Their revenue only went up a little bit year over year. Their net income was up huge. And this, this is possible when you can cut costs, when you can uh, be more efficient with your capital. You can uh, find ways to, be, to increase your gross margin on your products and services, basically. Next category is the dividends. And I don't want to get into it in this video, but basically dividends don't matter as far as the performance of a stock. And some companies prefer not to pay a dividend like Berkshire Hathaway because it's tax inefficient. If you pay out a dividend to your investors, uh, it's a taxable event. Long term, you're paying 15% on that distribution. So many companies prefer instead to do stock buybacks. However, I do like seeing a very small dividend at least because it shows the company is focused on re returning profits of the company to their investors. So Apple, a very cute small dividend to 0.52%, HCA 0.82. But with certain companies like General Dynamics, Texas Instruments, and Capital One, when their dividend yield is higher than the 10-year yield you can get on US Treasury notes, all of a sudden this attracts uh, long-term investors. So if you are a large fund manager and you can either buy U.S. Treasuries currently offering 1.4%, or you can buy a dividend-paying stock like Capital One or General Dynamics and get a higher yield on your investment over 10 years. These stocks just don't fall very hard, guys. When there's a market sell-off, companies like General Dynamics, Texas Instruments, they don't really go down because dividend investors, long-term investors, will happily scoop up these stocks because when the share price goes down, the dividend yield goes up and it becomes more attractive. Next column is shares outstanding and once again these companies are using company profits to buy back shares. So if you're an owner of this company, your equity in the company increased alone just from the company using uh, company profits to buy back stock and basically remove it from circulation. So uh, Apple reduced their share count year over year by 3.7%, General Dynamics 2.4%, Capital One 3.9%, Berkshire Hathaway 52 fantastic. So what you can do between the dividend yields and the share counts uh, percentage reduced is put those two numbers together. So add 3.78 and 0.52, that's basically how much of company profits was used to uh, either pay out a dividend or increase your equity in the company. So this is directly profits from the company being used to pay you as the investor for SPACs and IPOs and uh, you know traditional growth stocks. They don't pay dividends and they're not buying back shares of stock. They're issuing new shares. So this is a negative number. They're they're basically you're basically you're basically paying the company. To get bigger and yes you can succeed through capital appreciation making the stock more valuable but it's it's harder it's definitely riskier uh, you know the the companies that grow the fastest and don't make a profit have the highest risk of going bankrupt or 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 being taken over so the pattern that i look for when i pick stocks is are they returning company profits to the investors i'm just not interested if they aren't doing this with PDE and price to sales, you can also look at price to book value or price to free cash flow. I got all these numbers from macrotrends.net and I like that website because it visually shows you 
where the company has been valued in the past. So you can look at their current PDE and Apple at 28 might look very high. You can look at Capital One and 5.4 might look very low. It's very important if you're new, especially to investing, to look at that number over its history and say, where have investors valued this company in the past relative to its past? Is it overvalued or undervalued or appropriately valued right now? So I look for stocks that are not too overvalued based on their price ratios. Okay guys, that was a total recap of my Schwab portfolio. Hopefully you guys were also green today. I want your investments to succeed and I hope that um, you know from my videos you can learn to be a better investor. Once again, if you enjoyed this video, give me a thumbs up so the algorithm knows it's good. If you have any comments or questions, let me know down below. I love hearing from you guys. Till the next video, take care.